There are many iconic locations in Australia. The Big Rock, the Big Bridge, Nazi Captain Cook. But there are two sites that will always be sacred to rock fans all over the country. Firstly, the hallowed ground that is these days the rather unprepossessing building at 139 King Street, Sydney, or Australia's Motown. Albert Records had their studios from 1973 to 1975. This is where ACDC cut their first five albums. Plus, there were number one singles for Stevie Wright, William Shakespeare, and Ted Mulry, as well as a torrent of other big hits for John Paul Young, The Angels, Rose Tattoo, Bobby Marcini, Cheetah, and many others. The other of the two sites in Sydney is number four, Burley Street in Burwood, where a certain Bill and Margaret Young finally settled to raise their boisterous and soon-to-be world-conquering clan. Albert Records started in 1970, still recording in the studios of Radio 2UW in George Street, and production duties generally fell to Albert himself and Paul Samuel Smith, the man Jimmy Page replaced in the Yardbirds. Their first release was a hit, Ted Mulry's Falling in Love Again, a song written by Harry Vander and George Young, members of Albert's former act, The Easy Beats. Vander and Young provided the first hit for another of Albert's mainstays, John Paul Young, with 1972's Pasadena. But the label was still more miss than hit, despite some of the misses being excellent. Bobby Marcini was a unique talent who made some strong singles, but she now seems largely forgotten. Ted Albert decided that in order to establish a stronger brand and better quality control, while he needed to retain control over A&R and quality control, he wanted writing a production aimed at a specific label sound. So in late 1973, he called Harry Vander and George Young in London and made them a very special offer. George Young was one of eight children of Bill and Margaret who hailed from the Cranhill district of Glasgow, seven of whom immigrated with them to Australia on assisted passage in 1963. Unlike the BGs who came by boat, the Youngs flew. Five of the seven boys in the family became professional musicians. Stephen, Alex, who played in various British bands and was a session guitarist. George, of course, played in the Easy Beats, who had three number one singles for Alberts. And the youngest brothers, Malcolm and Angus, whom we'll meet shortly. Stephen's son, Stevie, George's nephew, was also a guitarist, and we'll meet him right at the end. Arriving in Sydney, the Youngs were first quartered in the Villawood Immigration Centre, a crowded, uncomfortable arrangement which was unable to cope with the surge of immigrants under the Assisted Immigration Programme. It was there that George met a pair of Dutch immigrants, Johannes Vanderberg and Dingerman van der Schluss, as well as Englishmen Gordon Fleet and Stevie Wright. Finally, they all had a common bond of music, and led by Vandenberg, who took the stage name Harry Vander, who had played previously in a band in Holland, they formed the Easy Beats. The importance of the Easy Beats in the scheme of Australian music both can and cannot be overstated. It can because the scope of what they did can tend to overshadow the rest of Australia's 1960s musical legacy. And it can't because they were more than a band that had three number one hits in 1966. They were a band that showed the world that Australian bands could play with the hard swagger of the best British and American bands. They were the focus and the soundtrack to the emerging teen energy that accompanied the end of the uptight Menzies era. They were some tangible proof, not to outside eyes, but to those in the shadows from which they emerged, that the multicultural experiment that was the 1960s and 70s Australia could work, and their records became the template for the sound which, ten years later, would become the template sound for Australian rock, and is still today the sound that so many guitar bands are striving to emulate. The special offer that Albert made to Vander and Young was to return to Australia to firstly oversee the bedding in at the new King Street Studios and then to act as writer-producers with a stable of acts Ted Albert was assembling around the label. Vander and Young came to work for Albert on a handshake. There was never a contract between them and Albert and set about two special projects to start. Establishing a production template for Albert's and resurrecting the career of ex-Easy Beat singer Stevie Wright. The latter was to be achieved via the former. The first project Vander and Young worked on was the Marcus Hook Roll Band's album Tales of Old Granddaddy, an album of bluesy hard rock which was fine at face but wasn't really exceptional enough to transcend its lack of a very good vocalist. But it did introduce George's younger brothers, Malcolm and Angus, to the recording studio. Malcolm is instantly recognisable where he appears. Angus is somewhat more circumspect than we'd come to expect from him. The album laid out Vander and Young's basic production template. Thin, loud, dry guitar sounds, thumping four square drums and accentuated choruses. The lessons were put to good use on Stevie Wright's comeback record, Evie, parts one, two, and three, an 11 minute mini opera that even notoriously conservative AM radio stations would play in its entirety. Evie was released in April 1974 and hit number one on August 12th, staying there a month. While the Marcus Hook template worked for Stevie, Bander and Young had other tricks up their sleeves. The week Evie hit number one, William Shakespeare was at number 12, bound for number two, with the spectrish glam pop of the glorious Can't Stop Myself From Loving You. Shakespeare was to hit number one with another Vander and Young song, the in every way inferior to its predecessor, My Little Angel. 
Accompanying that song up the chart was Yesterday's Hero by John Paul Young, which made number 41 in the USA, and aided by a colour video clip shown on Count, the Sunday night pop music show on the ABC, which was rapidly gaining a cult following, elevated Young to superstar status and began a string of Vander and Young written and produced hits. Ten of his next 11 singles made the top 20. They also had two hits of their own as Flash in the Pan, Hey St. Peter and Down Among the Dead Men, both of which hit the top 10. But while Vander and Young were placing pop hits, which would have become radio standards on the charts in their golden four-year run, their B project was coming along nicely too. It's at this point that the hierarchy within the office was established. Albert was a talent scout and signed the bands. He also had final approval over what was and what was not released. And that wasn't done until he'd listened to the song sitting alone in his car in the car park over the cheapest car stereo he could have installed. If it sounded good on that, it was right for release. Albert only upgraded it in 1990 because he wanted to hear ACDC's album The Razor's Edge in all its glory. He died a week later. Vander and Young had executive production powers, they allocated the studios, and the time each band got, they doled out the songs. Some artists, like Ted Mulry, were big enough to get around this, but most weren't, or were smart enough not to want to. Fifa Riccobono, the business school graduate who joined Alberts as a receptionist in 1968 and worked her way up to become CEO after Ted Albert died, made sure the bills and the bands got paid and became Albert's most trusted fixer, both for problems the band had and in negotiating with recalcitrant business partners, somewhat like the fearsome Miriam Abramson had been for Atlantic in the 1950s. Having introduced Brothers Malcolm and Angus with the Marcus Hook Band, it's debatable whether or not Malcolm played on Evie. It sounds a lot like him, but I can't find documents to confirm. Vander and Young turned their attention to Malcolm's band. ACDC. In 1973, ACDC was struggling to find an identity, torn between a glamorous style and the natural four to the floor instincts of Malcolm Young. The first set of lineup consisted of Mal and Angus, Dave Evans on vocals, Colin Burgess, ex of the Master's Apprentices, on drums, and the frankly overqualified Larry Van Clyde on bass. Vander and Young signed them up to Alberts, and the first single, Can I Sit Next to You Girl, with Van Clyde gone and George Young on bass, was released in 1974 and spent 10 weeks in the lower reaches of the charts, peaking at number 50. About six weeks after the first peak into the top 50, a singer named Bon Scott was introduced to the band by George Young via the Valentine singer Vince Cosgrove. Scott, who did stints in the Valentine's Spectre and Fraternity, was also known to Young, Young having produced singles for the Valentines in 1968. Young felt that Scott may have suited Malcolm's vision of the band better and also felt that at seven years older and having been in the industry for some years, Scott may have been a stabilising influence on the band. <laughs> Scott's first gig with the band was at Victoria Park Swimming Pool in August 1974. The Victoria Park Pool was where, at a previous gig, Angus had debuted his schoolboy outfit. The first single with him, Baby Please Don't Go, made number 20, boosted by an appearance on Countdown where Scott dressed as a tattooed schoolgirl, cigarette in one hand and brandishing a giant mallet in the other. Malcolm smiling, Angus in his schoolboy uniform, and the rest of the band in their satin glammy attire. It was a cultural high watermark for Australia. The first album, The Very Uneven High Voltage, was released in February 1975, the band recording it in the small hours of the morning having played each night of a week-long engagement at the prestigious Checkers nightclub. Then drummer Peter Clack would be so exhausted that George Young would replace him with Tony Carrenti. Carrenti later became famous for his pizza shop, the best in Sydney, so they say, in Penshurst. The single High Voltage, which made number 10 for a single week, was not included on the album, which reached number 14. And the follow-up, TNT, released in December featuring new members Mark Evans on bass and Phil Rudd on drums, did much better making number two and introducing us to the fully realised ACDC sound. The pounding rock steady drums of Phil Rudd, Malcolm's more clenched rhythm guitar style, Scott embracing the slightly ludicrous and self-parodying character he became. There was now also a clear demarcation between Malcolm and Angus's guitar parts. The songs are for the most part better except the Jack and the overlong and forced cover of Chuck Berry's School Days. 1976 saw Albert start the year with a six-week number one, with the Ted Albert produced Jump In My Car for the Ted Mulry game. They also had number two with John Paul Young's Earwormy I Hate the Music. Mulry got to number three with Darktown Strutter's Ball and had his best quality, if not biggest ever hit, with number ten in Crazy. John Paul Young racked up another hit with Keep On Smiling, and it's a long way to the top. It's got to number nine. All of these songs, except Jump In My Car, were written and produced by Vander and Young, but Vander and Young did produce David Hasselhoff's version of it's a long way to the top with this now iconic video of the band on a flatbed truck in Swanston Street, Melbourne, as well as the bagpipe performance by Scott was the commercial high watermark for ACDC in Australia. Scott came to play the pipes after claiming he'd played in a pipe and drum band as a youngster. It was only after the exorbitant price of $479 had been laid out for a set of pipes that it was revealed somewhat sheepishly by Scott that he'd been a drummer in the band, not a piper. Scott, however, knew how to play the recorder and he did pick up the bagpipes remarkably quickly. The band then discovered that the bagpipes are 
are, let's put it bluntly, weird as they don't tune to concert pitch. So the band had to tune to the drone of the bagpipe and they had to play just slightly off in concert, which meant the song was seldom performed live until the bagpipes were torn apart by fans during a gig in 1977. The third album, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, showed a shift in the band's strategy. While the juvenile novelty songs were still there, there were also some lengthier workouts aimed at the US market, presumably. The title track is a rare example of an ACDC song written in a minor key. The album did well enough reaching number 5, but the singles, Jailbreak, only made number 19 and the title track number 29. And by now, the label was pouring a lot of money into trying to launch the band internationally, but to very little return. Bander and Young also produced the Angels' debut album in 1976. As the Keystone Angels, they'd been ACDC's opening act and had also been Chuck Berry's backing band on a recent tour. The debut album introduced their anthem, Am I Ever Gonna See Your Face Again? However, without the soon-to-be mandatory chant which counterpointed the first line of the chorus. For their second album, 1978's Face to Face, which stayed on the charts for 80 weeks, Vander and Young promoted sound engineer Mark Opitz to producer, thus kicking off a production career that would not only put Australian music on the world stage, but made it competitive in the world market. In the first half of the 70s, Vander and Young weren't just limited to Albert. Ronnie Burns and Alison McCallum both had major hits with Vander and Young songs Love Fever and Superman, respectively. By 1977, both Stevie Wright and William Shakespeare, the two artists who'd had number one hits that kept the label afloat in the early days and had allowed for long-term projects like ACDC to survive, were cut from the label due to their personal problems, and both went to sad and protracted fates. John Paul Young was still flying high for the label on the charts. 1977 saw the debut of Rose Tattoo, who came out of the gates with a terrific self-titled album so hot and raw it made ACDC sound like yacht rock. Vander and Young get the best drum sound they ever had on this album and they push it right up to the front. Peter Wells' slide guitar set the band apart from anyone else on the scene. Angry Anderson's lyrics were so much more real feeling and streetsy than what George Young would call Bon Scott's toilet wall poetry. This is allied to some great songs, Rock and Roll Outlaw, Nice Boys, Bad Boy for Love, their top 20 debut single, The Butcher and Fast Eddie. When Alberts pushed ACDC to Atlantic Records for US record distribution, they were lukewarm on ACDC because they thought Rose Tattoo was the better band. In the end, they got both of them, ACDC on Atlantic and Rose Tattoo through Mirage Records. Listen to Rose Tattoo's album against ACDC's Let There Be Rock, and you can see why Atlantic was so keen. ACDC get a lot right on Let There Be Rock, you can hear their progress, but Rose Tattoo are whole born from the start. ACDC are sleazy and grindy, Rose Tattoo are fast and ferocious. But while ACDC pressed on and reached their pinnacle at the next album, Rose Tattoo stumbled, and their next album, Assault and Battery, excellent as it was, didn't appear until 1981. Still determined to crack the US market, Alberts had finally learned the lesson that so many Australian bands failed to. The UK is not the primary outlet market for Australian bands. Go straight to the US. ACDC took inspiration from the harsh judgment of the critics aimed at Let There Be Rock and channeled their frustration into a relentless determination to go forward. Mark Evans was removed as bassist after falling out with Angus and replaced by Cliff Williams. Commander and Young, and along with new engineer Mark Opus, who took over from Bruce Brown, gave the band a rawness and sense of heft that it never had before. It's not to say the pop hawks aren't there. Rock and Roll Damnation, the sequel, if you like to let there be rocks, a hell ain't a bad place to be, actually swing. But for the most part, it's searing blues rock sharpened by Scott's most incisive set of lyrics yet, including his masterpiece, No, I ain't doing much, but doing nothing means a lot to me. In a change of pace for Vander and Young, they produced Walking in the Rain for the regular backup singers Chrissy and Lindsay Hammond, billed as Cheetah, which made the top 10, and the disco smash Love is in the Air for John Paul Young, which amazingly did not make number one, topping out at number three. Alberts were also starting to benefit from overseas sales as well at this point, with John Paul Young, Flash in the Pan and Rose Tattoo all selling significant numbers in Europe. Well, as things were going, ACDC was still the problem child for the label. Powerage didn't make the top 20 in Australia. Their days as a singles band were long behind them and large venue gigs were almost impossible to find in Australia. Albus were putting money into trying to keep the group afloat on the road and in the US and UK. Any other band would have been dropped and Albert would have cut their losses. But Ted Albert believed in the band and he had too much to lose. There were also problems inside the band. Malcolm was hell-bent on sacking Scott for his increasingly erratic behaviour and the rumours of his heroin use. If Ted Albert had found out, he would have insisted Scott be replaced. Bon hung in, though, because it was one of the few times Angus disagreed with Malcolm and also through the likely influence of FIFA Riccobono, who was seen as the one moderating influence on Scott, the one person he really listened to and took advice from. In the end, there was a parting of the ways. 
not with Bon Scott, but with Vander and Young. Atlantic Records were prepared to drop the band while they felt that they had enormous potential. Unless the band was willing to work with a more radio-friendly producer, then they couldn't go ahead with them. Albus desperately needed to recoup on the investment, so against Malcolm's wishes, they were paired with Eddie Kramer and sent to Miami to record. It did not go well. Kramer pissed off Malcolm immediately with his cocky attitude and with his disrespectful behaviour towards Scott. It just set off the entrenched siege mentality within the band. Behind Kramer's back, they produced half a dozen demos, which manager Michael Browning shopped to Mutt Lang, a rising hotshot producer, who immediately won the respect of the band. Press troubles, the band sacked Michael Browning. Well, as the ensuing Highway to Hell album did, it didn't break the top 10 in Australia. Eventually, after Back in Black, it did make the top 30 in the US, and it went some, but not all of the way, towards getting the band out of Hock to Albert's. But it would be that next album, Back in Black, that did that and made ACDC superstars. But that would also be without Bon Scott, who barely made it in the 80s, dying on February 19th, 1980. Alberts went on, John Paul Young faded from the scene after he went a step too far into disco with Standing in the Rain, Ted Mulry unexpectedly and controversially split to arch-rivals Mushroom Records, Stevie Wright sank into hopeless heroin and alcohol addiction, William Shakespeare to drink and depression, and reduced to sleeping in public toilet blocks until Lindy Morrison of The Go-Betweens arranged help for him. Rose Tattoo went on to make some more excellent albums with Vander and Young into the mid-80s. The Angels also left Alberts, a move they later described as a huge mistake, but to this day are, like Rose Tattoo, still a beloved national institution. Mark Oberts went on to a stellar career as a producer with In Excess, Cold Chisel, Australian Crawl, The Divinals, Hoodoo Gurus, etc., and is still regarded as one of the best producers and engineers in the world. ACDC now with Cousin Stevie, replacing the sadly departed Malcolm Young, go on and on and on. Now so far divorced from the powerful, hungry band of Powerage, and so far divorced from the tinderbox and competitive environment that spawned them, they sit fat and comfortable atop the heap. Harry Vander still lives in Sydney in Double Bay, but George Young passed away in 2017, a few weeks before Malcolm sadly died after a long battle with early onset dementia. Ted Mulry passed away in 2001 from a brain tumour, as did charismatic vocalist for the Angels, Doc Neeson, in 2014. Stevie Wright died in 2015. Ted Albert, the man who started it all on Blind Faith in 1964, died of a heart attack in 1990, aged 53. One of the last things he did was write a letter to Malcolm Young telling him how much he enjoyed the Razor's Edge album and telling Young he was proud of him. Fifa Riccobono took the helm in 1990 and it really was her common sense and tough exterior that kept the label afloat during the rocky 70s and it was her caring and clever interior that got many a young man out of a potentially embarrassing scrape during that time too. Harry Vander and George Young worked together many times after the golden age of Alberts ended, reuniting in various forms with ACDC, for example, whenever the band felt they'd strayed too far from the path. George is gone, but Harry remains good-humoured and avuncular as ever. Alberts didn't make Australian music. That much talent would have found a way out somehow, but he did focus it and define it over a 20-year period from 1965 to 1985, and the 70s was the golden era. It was a long way to the top, but with Harry Vander and George Young doing the heavy lifting, they reached it. <laughs> 